welcome back children coming to chapter review of geometrical optics in this part we will be studying about dispersion scattering and optical instruments so coming to dispersion it is splitting of white light into its component wavelengths when it passes through material such as prism and thick lenses dispersion is because of variation of refractive index with wavelength according to the cauchy's formula mu is equal to a plus b by lambda square since lambda of violet is less than lambda of red mu of violet will be greater than mu of red red bends least when it passes through a prism and violet bends more so violet has more deviation than red color coming to the prism formula we have studied during refraction through a prism whose angle of refraction is capital a what is the relation between the two angles of refraction See, if I is the angle of incidence, R1 and R2 are the angle of refractions, E is the angle of emergence and A represents the angle of prism. Then we have proved that R1 plus R2 is equal to capital A and delta is equal to I plus E minus A. I is the angle of incidence, E is the angle of emergence. And when deviation becomes minimum, okay, if you observe deviation versus incidence angle of incidence graph the nature of graph is a inverted parabola when deviation is minimum i and e will become equal if i and b e becomes equal r1 and r2 also become equal and using this condition we have calculated the refractive index of the prism by using the formula mu is equal to sine of a plus delta m by 2 by sine a by so remember this formula based on this you get some applications then conditions for minimum deviation just now i told you i and e become equal r1 and r2 become equal and the refracted ray becomes parallel to base of the prism provided it is an isosceles prism and deviation will be minimum delta becomes minimum then condition for grazing incidence Okay, grazing incidence is angle of incidence has to become 90 degree. Since angle of incidence has become 90 degree, R1 becomes equal to theta c. Okay, we know when light has angle of incidence as 90, using Snell's law, we get the value of R1 as equal to theta c. Since R1 is theta c, theta c is equal to sine inverse of 1 by mu from total internal reflection condition. Okay, substituting it, we can get the value of R2, that is angle of refraction at the second surface. So, what is angle of refraction at second surface? Angle of refraction at second surface will be A minus theta C. And when you apply Snell's law for the second surface, you can find out the deviation. And remember, deviation becomes maximum. So, this is also the condition for maximum deviation. So, what is the condition for maximum deviation? deviation will be maximum when you put i equal to 90 degrees so maximum deviation is 90 plus e minus a then condition for no emergence okay the meaning of no emergence is if you incident light on a prism assume that this is a prism and you are incidenting a light ray it has to graze the second surface or it should undergo total internal reflection at the second surface then we call this as the condition of no emergence. To get this condition of no emergence, after simplifying the relations, the condition comes out to be angle of prism. If it is greater than two times the critical angle, then this will give you the condition for no emergence. And if A becomes greater than two theta C, theta C is the critical angle. We can also write mu as one greater than one by sine A by two where A is the angle of prism. Okay, these are the conditions for the light ray not to emerge out of the prism and undergo total internal reflection. Okay, remember these formulas for thin prisms. Again, I am repeating, these are the formulas for thin prisms. For a thin prism, sin theta tends to theta and sin i and sin r also will become equal to i and r. Then we get the formula for deviation as delta is equal to mu minus 1 into a. For any angle of deviation, sorry, any angle of incidence, 
deviation will be mu minus 1 into e. Then come to what do you mean by angular dispersion. So just now I told you light ray passing through a prism splits into its composite colors. The deviation produced by violet color minus deviation produced by red color. This is called as angular dispersion. See this formula you can apply for any prism. But if the prism is thin, you can modify it into mu v minus mu r into a. Again I am repeating mu v minus mu r into a is only for thin prisms. But for any prism, angular dispersion is delta v minus delta r. Then dispersive power of a prism. Okay, This tells you about the dispersion produced by a prism represented by omega which is delta v minus delta r by delta. Here remember delta is the average deviation, average angular dispersion in the sense delta v plus delta r by 2. Again I am repeating delta is equal to delta v plus delta r by 2 average value. And if the prism is again thin you can also write this dispersive power omega as mu v minus mu r by mu minus 1. Okay, here again mu is mu average, mu e plus mu r by 2 or generally yellow is taken as the average value and you can express it as d mu by mu minus 1. Okay, if you write mu e minus mu r as change in refractive index, we can also write it as d mu omega is equal to d mu by mu minus 1. And from Cauchy's formula, see we have just now studied what is Cauchy's formula, mu is equal to a plus b by lambda square. When you differentiate it with respect to wavelength, d mu by d lambda comes out to be minus 2b by lambda q. And here this d mu by d lambda is known as dispersive power of a medium. Okay, For any medium, if dispersive power is asked, you can write it as d mu by d lambda. Then if the prism is a hollow prism, then it is not going to show you any dispersion. In fact, it behaves like a glass plate where there will be a lateral shift of the rays. If this is your incident ray, it emerges from here producing some lateral shift. So hollow prisms do not show any dispersion. Then coming to conditions for deviation without dispersion and vice versa. See when you join two prisms in reverse order as shown in the figure, a white light which is incident, if it again emerges as a white light, then we call this as condition for deviation without dispersion. To get the condition for deviation without dispersion, angular dispersion of the first prism plus angular dispersion of second prism should be 0. And when you equate it to 0 for thin prisms, again I am repeating it is for thin prisms, we get this formula. Angle of the first prism is equal to minus of mu e minus mu r by mu e minus mu r into a dash. Okay, mu e minus mu r are the refractive index of violet and red color for the first prism and those dashes are for second prism. Now opposite, dispersion without deviation. So we know deviation is represented by delta mu minus 1 into a. So if the net deviation produced by two prisms is 0, then the condition becomes a is equal to minus of mu dash minus 1 by mu minus 1 into a dash. Okay, where mu is the average value of mu v and mu r. Or it can be replaced as for yellow color. Yellow is considered to be average of violet and red. Now look at one simple numerical related to prisms. What should be the value of theta, angle theta, such that the light entering normally on the face AC of a prism, refractive index is given 3 by 2, does not cross the second refracting surface. Okay, just now I told you, what is the condition for the light ray not to cross the second surface? It should be incident on the second surface and graze the surface. So for this to occur, there should be total internal reflection occurring at the second surface. Apply the condition. If you are incidenting the light ray, what will be the angle of incidence on the second surface? Okay, if I draw a normal here and this is your incident ray, angle of incidence will become 90 minus C. Okay, since this angle is theta, angle B is theta, angle of incidence becomes 90 minus C. And if 90 minus C becomes greater than, I mean 90 minus theta, I am sorry, 
90 minus theta becomes greater than critical angle that is C. It will undergo total internal reflection. Apply sign on either sides. What is the condition we are going to get? Theta should be, okay, when you put the refractive index as 3 by 2, theta should be. Now observe this question. In this question, the incident ray is given as shown in the figure, okay. This is your figure and this represents your incident array. And for that incident ray, they are asking you to prove that R1 minus R2, that means R dash minus R, where R dash and R are the refracting angles of a prism, I, the difference is equal to capital E. Generally, we get R1 plus R2 is equal to capital A, but here it is difference. Similarly, delta is equal to I minus E plus A. So, from the geometry of the triangle, okay, so look at the second diagram. In the second diagram, I have extended the emergent ray backward with red line. Angle of deviation is delta. Extend the dotted line normal by a green line. Point of intersection of normals is capital N. So, by from triangle P N Q, exterior angle should be interior opposite. Similarly, from triangle O P Q, exterior angle is equal to sum of interior opposite angles. Okay, when you use this tool, you can prove this conditions. Now look at the second question. In this question, they have given you two prisms not placed in reverse order. You are asked to find out the net angular dispersion. Okay, we know angular dispersion for thin prisms is mu v minus mu r into angle of prism. So apply the formulas, you can get what is the total angular dispersion. And we know deviation is mu minus 1 into a. Okay, where mu is the average of mu of violet and mu of red lights. So the data is given in the figure. It is a formula based application. So coming to this question, there were two identical isosceles prisms A and B are joined to form a single prism and they are asking you to find out the focal length if the height of incidence is H. See when a parallel beam of light passes through a prism, it is going to bend and produce a deviation delta. So this parallel beam will incident at a point called focus and we need to find out this focal length F. And it's already given height of incidence is equal to H. So from triangle, I mean by taking the tangent of this delta, okay, if I take this vertical distance as H, this distance is H, okay, from this triangle, tan delta is equal to H by F. And we know delta is nothing but deviation, which is mu minus 1 into A for thin prisms. So equate both of them, you can find out what is the focal length focal length comes out to be h by mu minus 1 into a. Now coming to scattering, okay, we know scattering is the phenomenon of re-emission of light after absorption, okay, particles absorb the light, remaining wavelengths it is going to emit and that is called as scattering and we have two types of scattering, one is elastic or rally scattering, other one is inelastic scattering. See in elastic scattering, Okay, when particle size is much lesser than the wavelength, there won't be any change in frequency or wavelength of the scattered light. Whereas in inelastic scattering, it occurs when the particle size is greater than the incident wavelength, frequency and wavelength of the scattered light will change. And for Rayleigh's criteria, what is Rayleigh's criteria? Intensity of the scattered light for elastic scattering is directly proportional to 1 by lambda to the power 4. Okay, it is inversely related to fourth power of its wavelength. So, using this relation, we have proved that why the color of sky is blue. Because blue has lesser wavelength, it is scattered more, I mean it is scattered less. It is inversely related to intensity of scattering. Lesser wavelengths will have more intensity of scattering and larger wavelengths will have less intensity of scattering. So the color of the sky appears to be blue. Sun appears red during sunrise and sunset again due to scattering. Then white color of the clouds. If all the wavelengths are scattered, it appears to be white in color. If all the wavelengths are absorbed, then the color appears to be black. When there is no atmosphere for scattering, sky appears to be black from the surface of moon. Then coming to the last part of the chapter that is optical instruments, we know we have classified them into microscopic, 
that is simple and compound microscope microscopic instruments used for observing macroscopic objects that is telescope astronomical and terrestrial and one reflecting telescope what we studied is cassegrain okay, coming to a simple microscope we know it is used for magnifying the objects and we generally use magnification for to calculate magnification the method of angular magnification see without any instrument the angle subtended by human eye is theta naught in the presence of an instrument the angle is going to increase so the increase in angle is a measure of magnification so we know for a simple microscope if your image is at far point that is at infinity magnification is d by f okay where d is 25 cm for a normal human eye and if your image is at near point then magnification is 1 plus d by f where f is the focal length of the convex lens and since we cannot magnify an object beyond a certain limit in simple microscope we have gone for a second device that is compound microscope so coming to a compound microscope here i have shown you the image which is formed at near point that is 25 centimeter what does a compound microscope contain it consists of two lenses two convex lenses the first one is of smaller aperture and smaller focal length second one is of larger aperture and smaller focal length to have a better magnification and we know that the image formed by the object object is ab the image formed by the objective lens is real inverted and magnified and that becomes object for the second lens and final image is much more magnified so the total magnification is product of magnifications of the two lenses so if your image is at near point what is your formula for magnification okay we know it is minus v naught by u naught into 1 plus d by fe and approximately you can write it as l by f naught into 1 plus d by fe if they give you the length of the telescope then you can approximate it as l by f naught into 1 plus d by fe but it is only an approximate relation because image is formed very close to the second lens and length of this compound microscope is the distance between the two lenses which is v naught plus ue now if your image is at far point then formula for magnification will change okay if your image is at far point for a compound microscope okay then magnification formula will change to v naught by u naught into d by fe and length will be v naught plus fe coming to a refracting telescope which makes use of lenses okay we are using two lenses first one is large in aperture and it has a large focal length whereas second one is small in aperture and small focal length for a better magnification and if your image is at near point what is magnification of a telescope given by remember telescopes first lens will not produce any magnification second lens that is eye lens, eye lens or eyepiece alone can produce the magnification what is the magnification it is minus f naught by fe into 1 plus fe by d and length of the telescope is f naught plus ue and this is for normal adjustment of your refracting telescope if your image is at infinity then magnification will be minus of f naught by fe here minus sign indicates the image is inverted with respect to object and length is f naught plus fe and because refracting telescope has some defects chromatic and spherical aberration we have designed a cassegrain's telescope okay terrestrial telescope since i told you just now that the image is inverted to keep the image erect we use one more lens in between objective and eyepiece and that's called an erecting lens so for erecting lenses also formula of magnification is not going to change but the length of the telescope will be different okay length will be f naught plus two times the focal length of erecting lens plus fe fe is the focal length of eye lens coming to the defects of images okay when you use thick lenses and lenses of large aperture there may be spherical and chromatic aberrations aberration is a defect in the image spherical aberration is because of the marginal and paraxial rays coming to a different focus so here the rays which are at the edges of the lens these rays are called marginal the rays which are very close to principal axis are called paraxial marginal rays will come to one focus paraxial rays will come to another focus 
then image is extended and unclear. This defect is called as spherical aberration. Then how to minimize it? By covering the lens with stops. That means you can cover the lens, okay, you can cover the upper part of the lens with a paper. Like you can close the marginal rays and allow only paraxial rays and then you can minimize the spherical aberration. But this will be at the cost of its intensity. The second way to minimize is instead of using a convex lens, you can make use of a plano convex lens. But when you are using a plano convex lens, see that the plane surface is towards converging beam or curved su surface should be towards parallel beam. Say if you observe the two diagrams below, okay, in the first case we observe a large difference in marginal and paraxial focus. But if curved surface is face facing the parallel beam, you can reduce the spherical aberration. So this is only a method to minimize the spherical aberration. Another way of minimizing is instead of a single lens make use of two lenses separated by a distance such that d is equal to f1 minus f2. So in such a case you can minimize the spherical aberration or spherical aberration you can even observe in mirrors. It can be reduced by using parabolic mirrors. Parabolic mirrors will give you less spherical aberration when compared with spherical mirrors. Then coming to chromatic aberration, it is a defect of the lens because of different colors of white light coming to a different focus. See in the diagram you can observe focal length of red is more than focal length of violet. So this difference in the focal length due to different colors coming to a different focus is called chromatic aberration. To minimize chromatic aberration, we will be using an achromatic doublet. It is a combination of a convex and a concave lens of different materials such that they obey this condition. Omega 1 by F1 plus omega 2 by F2 should be 0. But while choosing F1 and F2, take care the equivalent focal length should be positive. That means this combination of two lenses should behave as a convex lens. So for that, F2 should be greater than F1, F2 is the focal length of concave lens, must be greater than the magnitude of focal length of convex lens. One more way to reduce this, minimize, I mean minimize the chromatic aberration is by using two convex lenses separated by a distance of F1 plus F2 by 2. To minimize spherical aberration, it should be F1 minus F2. To minimize chromatic aberration, it should be F1 plus F2 divided by 2. Now one more telescope which is called a reflecting telescope which reduces or which eliminates this spherical and chromatic aberration is Cassegrain's telescope. So it is a very big device, okay, it consists of a parabolic mirror. So the moment you use a parabolic concave mirror with a hole at the center, okay, this will reduce spherical aberration. See a parallel beam of light coming from infinity falls on this lens, I mean on this mirror parabolic mirror and gets reflected towards another mirror okay there we are going to make use of a convex mirror here a convex mirror is used and this mirror will direct the rays towards the eyepiece okay where you can see the image a grains telescope so in telescope will be based on 